This week on Crossbeat, O'Reilly versus Dawkins. Is that fair? A good old fashioned Bible, Bible burning? Atheists love religion. Scientists propose the Babelfish theory, and moon passes to the sun. Hello, everyone, and welcome to CrossFit Religious News. I'm Pastor Dale Critchley, pastor of Shepherd the Rich Lutheran Church in North Ridgeville, Ohio. And in a moment, we'll be joined by my uh, co-host, Pastor Jim Butler, out in Dedham, Massachusetts, near Boston. And um, the reason that you're just seeing me at the moment, hearing my voice in the, in the introduction, is because uh, we had a bit of a glitch uh, at the beginning of the show. Uh, about halfway through our first story, we... Uh, I used Skype to record this. Skype just froze up on me and quit. And when I went to get the recording of that segment, uh, it was there was nothing there. It was it was corrupted beyond use. And so I apologize for that. Um, but Jim is back, and we'll take you to the show already in progress. Uh, we're talking in the opening uh, part about uh, Reverend Sun uh, Sun Young Moon. Uh, the founder of the Unification Church, all probably best known as the Moonies. And um, he is turning 90, and he's in the process of handing over uh, his empire, uh, which is nowadays more of a financial empire and still definitely a, a religion, a bit of a cult. Uh, and um, But he's passing that on to his son. Uh, he has three sons, and each one of them is part of uh, uh, is taking over a different segment, um, but it's actually the youngest son uh, that he is passing on the sort of religious segment to. And so we take you uh, to the show already in progress. Again, I apologize for the technical difficulties. And now for something completely different. As I was about to say, the um, I can't remember what his scriptures were called. Um, but I, uh, he, he has a whole, very uh, uh, strong emphasis in on, in, on sex. He says that that was the original sin, which is why Adam and Eve made these coverings for themselves over their genitals, uh, and, and that was it. In that, yeah, she, 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 Eve had a sexual relationship with Satan. Ah, uh, okay. So no, I, there's a. I know there's a big emphasis on bloodlines that Jesus was supposed to get married and pass on his his bloodline mm -hmm. and he didn't since he was killed before he could get married. Um, <laughs> so he, he wouldn't like Dan Brown either. Um, the, then uh, basically uh, Sun Man Moon was uh, forced to um, kind of pick up the ball, so to speak. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> right. But yeah, he did. He, he picked up the, um, yeah, he was he was the new one, and he's the the the, the, new, the true parent. But that's why they also have all these uh, groups get involved in terms of uh, well, like this this particular story was this this um, uh, um, you know mass wedding again that he had. Uh, he had several of those. Now in this particular story, it said that that they had just met, and then they corrected that that wasn't correct. But that was true for many of the other weddings he did. These these couples never met before. However, he does emphasize the very strong morality. Um, he actually has a theological seminary. People don't realize that. I don't know if it still exists or not. It used to be one in Terrytown, New York. He'd bought some old seminary and brought in a bunch of liberal guys and then also had his uh, <coughs> unification people teaching on the same campus. Wow. Hey, you're a Ph.D. You're looking for a job? Huh. Yeah, boy, yeah. I don't know, you'd think that, I don't know, I, I guess I've always been figured that if you're a theologian, that you should, you know, also have some scruples. But Yeah. The other thing about his group is that uh, they, um, they they hide under a lot of um, false names. Um, uh, the Collegiate Association for the Research of the Principal Family Federation for World Peace and Unification, um, the Blessed Family Association, the Collegiate Associ uh, uh, um, 
uh, the Holy Spirit Association for the Unification of World Christianity. That's their old name. Um, oh gosh, but but every once in a while, you, I, I get this invitation to this group, uh, Pro America group for pastors and something in uh, which takes place in Boston. They have this big dinner, and that and that's a front group for the Unification Church. Um, so they they they've got a lot of, of, of front groups that they work under, and a lot of pastors don't even know. Uh, what those groups are, don't even know that they, you know, <laughs> they they've just been asked to go to a, uh, uh, you know, we'll go there, not know really what's going on. Yeah, I remember getting invitations to those kind of things in uh, in when I was in Iowa. They'd be in Cedar Rapids or Iowa City or something like that. Usually, they'd have some big speaker or something like that too. So, yeah. but a lot of them are. Um, of course, you know, and he was, his is one of the groups that was very popularly known for doing the, the brainwashing mm-hmm. uh, and the, the people being, you know, deprogrammed and everything. Um, but again, uh, you know, they would, you know, cut you off from your family, put you on this little uh, area and just love bomb you. And, you know, this is now your true parent. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, they call it the heavenly deception. It's nice. nice. But you, I mean, you gotta wonder then. I mean, how out of you know, it's a quarter of this that has about a hundred thousand members, and yet how he could have so many businesses and things. Yeah. Um, well, you know, if you're good at business, I, I, I gotta wonder how much his kids really believe this. I mean, it says you know, the the one who's in charge of the businesses was born in New York and educated at Harvard. Yeah. Um, and. Uh, you know, while his father remains the church's figurehead, he plans to make the movement more transparent. I caught that figurehead. <laughs> wow, I, I couldn't believe that. You know, to use that term. I mean, this guy's a Harvard graduate, so it's not like he doesn't have a good grasp of the English language. You know. <laughs> well, although that's not an exact quote, so it could be the reporter's take on what he said. It could be, but. But, um, yeah, so, um, so, but it's going to be interesting to see what happens when he, you know, I mean, he's 89 years old, he can't live much longer. Uh, what's going to happen to all this when he dies? I have a sneaking suspic- suspicion the church will say goodbye, but the businesses will continue. Well, I don't know, you know, L. Ron Hubbard philosophy, um, if you want to make a lot of money, start a religion, you yeah. know, so. Uh, and I don't, it may or may not. I mean, but who knows? I mean, if you look at the uh, Worldwide Church of God, um, when, you know, once her Armstrong and Garner Ted died, it's actually become quite evangelical. Yeah. Yeah. They actually became Christians. Uh, that, there that's was, a really cool story. I mean, just it's really amazing. One of the pastors up here in New England actually had a hand in that. So, but let's go to the other side. Now, I got a question. If you, if, if Sun Yun Moon didn't like the translation of his writings to a language, would he burn them? <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, this, um, this is kind of bizarre, really. Uh, but somehow it also doesn't surprise me. We got, uh, Pastor Mark Grizzard, um, from the Amazing Grace Baptist Church, which has 14 members. <laughs> so he's, he's, he's right up there with, um, what's his name? Um, oh, um, our buddy from uh, Topeka. Yeah. From from, from Kansas, uh, yeah. Fred Phelps. Yeah. Actually, I mean, I think he's smaller than Fred Phelps. Yeah, he is. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, not by much. Um, <coughs> they're uh, for, on Halloween night. They are um, to light a fire under true believers. Um, literally, uh, they're going to have a good old-fashioned book burning in which they're going to burn um, a bunch of Bibles and um, music and books by Christian authors like Billy Graham and Rick Warren. Because they're one of those King James-only uh, churches. You know, I've, I've, read, the, <laughs> I've read the Chick Tract. <laughs> on King James only. And uh okay, you know, here here's the here's the thing with uh 
with with the the whole King James only, and you know somebody else because it's been ten fifteen years since I've read it. Um, Dale used to distribute chick tracks. <laughs> Go Google um, Cthulhu Chick Track. <laughs> this is great. Actually, on a system, if you do, if you've never read Chick Track, you really do. They 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 really are kind of unique. And if you actually Google Chick Tracks, you can go online and you can download them and re- look through them. Um, but he has some wild conspiracy theories. Jack Chick does. Yeah. <laughs> um, and some wild, interesting, weird beliefs as well even church bodies that we disagree with but anyway one of the things is this um that somehow or another the king james is the inspired translation um yeah. they will argue that passages that we know for example that were added later uh were actually you know excised by you know people like origin and then you know but the real you know words got back and it's in the king james and so we know what you know what we know what it is, and and some of them will even argue that you know when you start to show them that what the King James translates and what the, the Greek and Hebrew have isn't correct, uh, will even argue that the um, the King James corrects the Greek and the Hebrew. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> uh, so, um, I, I, but they, they seem to be you know almost no understanding that this is actually Tyndale's tra- mostly Tyndale's translation and has a real history behind it. It didn't just kind of magically appear one day. Um, <laughs> That's the um, there was a, a, a poster in my uh, Greek class, uh, Jim Velt, and it said, "If English was good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for me." <laughs> <laughs> so here's the question I have to wonder. Is amazing is calling this church Amazing Grace Baptist Church a bit of an ir- irony here? <laughs> <laughs> I mean there doesn't seem to be much grace here. No, no, you know? there's not. No. Oh, and by uh, the way, I, since we're mentioning there was another story on about this thing. There's another Amazing Grace Baptist Church in that area, <laughs> and uh, there's been a little bit of confusion because this other church that has nothing to do with Pastor Grizzard uh, has been, um, they've been getting these, you know, these weird phone calls, and they're going, what? What's going on? <laughs> so they're, they're going, no, that's not us. <laughs> yeah. Um yeah, yeah, they're like, we're not that church, we're not that church. Now, I also kind of have to laugh. He says that other versions, such as the Living Bible. Okay, um, Pastor, the Living Bible is a paraphrase. Yeah, it's not, it's a, not translation. a translation. <laughs> Never claimed to be one. Yeah. It's, you know, that's just, it's just a, a, a paraphrase based on the King James. Um, <laughs> yeah, actually. I go figure. Um, you know, um, but I have read people who are kind of the same place who say things like, uh, uh, the new, uh, 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 uh you know, call it the, the new international perversion, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the revised standard perversion. You know, these are perversions of God's word because they uh, are based on, um, uh, what is it? What is it? Um, other manuscripts that, that aren't the Texas Receptus, what, what, you know, they use for the King James and, um. Yeah, here's the, for, for people that, that aren't familiar with it, there's, there's basically two textual, um, I want to say traditions, but that's probably not the, really two locations where most of the ancient manuscripts have been discovered. Um, it was Alexandria and uh, Antioch, right? Mm-hmm. Okay, um, and and I, I forget which is which, but basically, there's sort of um, and we I think we talked about this a little bit last time as far as this sort of minor variations. All right, well, most of the ones in Alexandria are all basically the same, um, subtle variations. All right, most of the ones in um, in Antioch are, are basically the same with minor variations. And um, 
And and what it comes down to is these are sort of scribal um, traditions when it came to copying. And so there are certain it it really you say well you know the the one group where and it's the one that the the King James is based on. There's a lot more manuscripts that follow that, and they they tend to run a little bit closer uh, as far as fewer variations among them. But you know then sort of the question is well so then do you just automatically give credence to the guy with the best Xerox machine, you know, which, I mean, the scribes. But. Well, the Texas Receptus tend to be all later manuscripts. Uh, mm-hmm. The Texas Receptus was actually the first edited manuscript. It was edited by Erasmus during Luther's day. And uh, he was the one who really put that thing together um, using what he had from the various manuscripts. Um, and, of course, the famous one, was um which was in the Vulgate, uh was um first John five, seven and eight, uh um where it says that you know there are three on earth who agree, the water, the blood, and the spirit, and there are three in heaven who who agree, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. And uh, Erasmus did not put that verse in because he said it's not in any Greek manuscript. And Rome, of course, said, well, you have to put it in. And he said, well, find me a Greek manuscript that it is, that where you find it, where it's there, and I'll put it in. Well, they found one. Well, not made it that night, but, you know, the ink wasn't <laughs> quite dry yet, but they found it. So uh, <laughs> so that's really where it came from. It, it actually came from, 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 from Erasmus. He was the one who edited it and put it together. So anyway, that's a little history in the King James Version. There's actually a lot of history you can you can you can read about it. A wonderful book. If you want to know more about textual criticism, um, it's, a, it's a text of the New Testament by by Bruce Metzger. Um, Bruce Metzger is professor at um, Princeton Theological Seminary. It used to be. I don't even know if Metzger's still alive or not. I think don't think he is. Didn't we? But uh, yeah, I, th- I think that we got called on that one. Yeah, I think we did. Um, but uh, wonderful scholar, was a wonderful scholar, really understood this stuff very well. But his book, The Text of the New Testament, will walk you through the whole textual history and how all this happened and, uh, um, you know, all the different things about it and give you the history then of the Texas Receptus. Um, that, that is an excellent book. Um, now, um, one of the people he was burning was Rick Warren. I wonder if it would make him feel any better to know that atheists like Rick Warren. <laughs> this is kind of fun. Um, the uh, all right, so the the sort of new atheist movement. Well, now there's a, there's a newer atheist movement. The sort of old new atheist movement. People like Christopher Hitchens, Richard Dawkins, Sam Harris. Um, these are the guys that were saying, um, uh, religion is bad. It's, uh, you know, pollutes the mind and, and is cause of all kinds of problems. And you're basically a nut job if you, you know, follow any kind of religion. And, and, you know, I mean, uh, Richard Dawkins is probably the, the most well-known of them. Um, he's published a few books recently. Um, and we'll talk about that more with the next story, but, uh, there's a new group, um, uh, for ACS 3.0. Yeah. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> um, uh, Bruce Scheiman is, uh, is one of them. And, uh, he says, uh, he, he wrote a book called an atheist defends religion. Why humanity is better off with religion than without it. Um, he's, he, he is an atheist. But he believes that the benefits of faith far outweigh its costs. So he doesn't believe, but he says, you know, basically, um, he's got kind of a, I think, really kind of a Marxist or kind of a variation on a Marxist view that he says, you know, it, it's sort of like, yeah, religion is the opiate of the masses, but it's also the moral compass of the masses, you know, and um, and so I, 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 I would, I don't think he, I, I need to read the book, but I don't think he quite says that. He says, um, yeah, more than any other institution, religion deserves our appreciation, respect, because it has persistently encouraged people to care deeply for the self, for neighbors, for humanity, for the natural world, and to strive for the highest ideals humans are able to envision. 
Now, I don't know if I, you know, I mean, that's a long way from Marx. It's an opiate for the masses, okay? Because that, that I mean, he okay, had no yeah. use for it. All right, yeah, fair enough. Um, but, so, yeah, it's, I, I don't know that that, I mean, I, I appreciate that evaluation. Um, I, I don't know if, if that's necessarily true because, um, when I, when I read that, uh, and, and a couple of his other quotes, I, I thought about, um, like Hinduism, for example, uh, and the whole, um, uh, one of these days I'm going to look up this word and see how it's supposed to be pronounced, but, um, cast or cased, um, system that is derived out of it. And the idea that, uh, if you were lower on the totem pole, you deserve it because you were bad in a past life. Um, right. Well, however, he says that he concedes that he limits his analysis to, to modern Western religion. Yeah. yeah so true. He, he doesn't deal with Hinduism and those, those types of things. Um, and he's not the only one. Um, I don't know if you ever read the book, um, I Sold My Soul on eBay, eBay by Hemat Mehta. Heard of it, but not read it. Wonderful book. Um, and he was asked to go, to, he's an atheist, and he was asked to, he, he, Oh, yeah, so I, I remember this that. time, so he got a bunch of different churches. And anyway, uh, one of the things he argues is that religion has done a lot of good things. You know, look at all the hospitals. Look at most of the hospitals. You know, St. Jude, St. Luke, uh, you know, uh, Trinity Hospital. I mean, they all they all have a, you know, a lot of them have a Christian background. Uh, a lot of, you know, who is running down, you know, to Katrina right away? It wasn't the atheists. It was the Christian groups. Uh, there is a lot of good stuff in religion, even though he doesn't believe in God. Yeah, you know, that's the same thing where where I think this guy is too. Is you know that uh, um, you know that that it's a good religion is a good thing, uh, even though they don't believe in it. And to say that uh, religious faith is a mental illness or something like that, which you know the the real negative guys work, they're going that's a zero sum game. We're all going to lose there. You know, you don't need to believe in God, but don't go out there insulting other people who are doing good work because they do. Okay. So now I asked some atheist friends of mine, um, the one of them posted on Facebook that there was a, a guy that, um, that spent like $20,000 putting up, um, placards all over New York city. Um, there was, a it said something like, uh, so many atheists um, get along just fine without God. Um, can you or something like that? It, it was sort of to encourage atheism kind of thing. And, and and I said, you know, why would somebody spend so much money just to say thanks but no thanks? I mean, Christians do it because we want everybody to go to heaven, all right? But, um, you know, we want to help people. But this isn't really, I said, this isn't really helping anyone. Why is he doing this? And, um, and, and one of the guys said, think of it as the way that if someone were involved in what you saw as a harmful cult, um, you know, you would try to talk them out of it. And, and he sees it, you know, he said, think of it that way. And, okay. You know, I can understand that. But here this, um, the Shyman and, and others uh, are saying, um, but you know, it's not really harmful. You may see it as a cult, but it's not harmful. So. Right. Um, and, you know, they'll even talk about, you know, and it's interesting, unlike those two, like the uh, um, Freedom from Religion Foundation, atheist groups like that, and, and of course the old Madeline Murray O'Hare stuff, they're like, um, you know, religion doesn't need to be removed from the, 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 the public square. Um, you know, uh, a godless public square not only shields religion from public criticism, it also circumvents a broader debate on morality, they argue. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so uh, um, my favorite, though, is this guy who uh, he's the humanist um, chaplain at Harvard who says um, the work we need to do with the atheists, humanists and nonbelievers is to build a better world and try not to tear down with those with whom we disagree. I kind of like that. I think he talks about uh, um, um, Rick Warren in his book, The Purpose Driven Life, and he says, you know, um, 
you have to have a purpose bigger than yourself, and not everything is all about you. He's absolutely right about that. But he's wrong in saying you have to believe in Jesus. If you don't, you're going to hell for eternity. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah, well, um, that was kind of interesting. But, yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll just, I mean, I think this is at least very okay. Um, he about made how runs a blog that I've checked out a couple of times. It's called the Friendly Atheist. Yeah, in other words, you know, he also agrees that this that this real negative, nasty viewpoint that Hitchens and Dawkins and people like that want to put on, it, it doesn't do anybody any good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, we, you know, I mean. I don't know about, you know, people up there and out there in Ohio and Iowa. Back in Missouri, we used to say you catch a lot more flies with honey than vinegar. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, I, and then you can at least have a dialogue and talk about what you agree with and what you disagree and build from there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, you know, I said, I've, I've got a lot of atheist friends. Um, and, uh, we have some really great discussions. I mean, there are people that um, that disagree with me and will throw all kinds of arguments um, in my direction because they they know that I'm willing to to hear them out, you know, and and discuss it with them. Um, and uh, so that's what we need to do. That's what we need to do. Whether you're an atheist or a Christian, uh, or or whatever your religion is all right talk about it you know talk to other people and and you know i i encourage uh, our people to talk to people of of different faiths and backgrounds and things like that because i mean the reality is that i i firmly believe that christians have nothing to fear from other religions whether it be uh another organized religion or whether it be you know atheism and because the reality is that I, I firmly believe that we have the truth and that the truth will hold up against anything that the world can throw at it. I mean, you know, people have been throwing stuff at Christianity for 2,000 years. It's still here. It's still holding up. And, you know, I've read the whole... We're, we're actually in our Sunday morning Bible class. We're going through... Uh, it's actually a 100-year-old... Uh, document written by an atheist that was uh, basically written to show how the Bible's not the word of God. And, um, you know, we've got a ways to go to get through it all. But, you know, the Bible's holding up. And, you know, we're, we're really trying to, um, to honestly address the concerns uh, in this document. And, yes, it's 100 years old, but... It's the same thing. I mean, I, I, the reason that I decided to use it is because it's a good collection of the same arguments that I hear on a regular basis today. And they haven't mm-hmm. really changed all that much. So, uh, but, you know, we do have the truth. And, um, you know, if you disagree with that, we would be happy to talk to you about it and um, hear you out and, and discuss those um, those differences. and listen to why you believe what you believe and we'll tell you why we believe what we believe and and we can talk about the differences but um you know that's yeah you just don't get anywhere by kind of flinging poo at people you know so and you would know (laughs) (laughs) no you know who would know richard dawkins would know (laughs) speaking of people flinging poo of course, yeah. we're we're talking about Bill O'Reilly and Richard Dawkins. <laughs> These are like the two chief poo flingers. <laughs> so, um, we we've got the, the transcript here from when Richard Dawkins was on the Bill O'Reilly show. Um. I, the only reason that Dawkins went on that show, as far as I can tell, is to promote his book. <laughs> it was purely to make money. Um, so well, of he, course. <laughs> so, um, new book says that evolution should be taught to every child in faith-based beliefs like intelligent design or hooey. His book is called The Greatest Show on Earth, The Evidence for Evolution. And, uh, and so we have this interview. And, and uh, it's just sad because... 
they just sort of go around in circles in their arguments and um you know they they basically have the three ar- the, or the same argument about three times and uh never really gets anywhere and um and the problem is bill o'reilly is no theologian um and really not much of a scientist and uh richard dawkins science is his theology and he treats science like theology instead of treating it like science so um <laughs> like okay let's have this discussion but we're going to start out with a whole bunch of faulty premises <laughs> yeah um well yeah Richard dawkins i mean he calls himself darwin's rottweiler for a reason uh, he tends to be very negative. I mean, he wrote the book The God Delusion, that God is, you know, just a delusion, and you're delusional if you believe in God. Um, and, you know, he admits that, you know, science doesn't know really where the world came from. Um, I mean, and, and, and O'Reilly, by the way, isn't, isn't a seven-day creationist. He's, he believes in intelligent design. He's really a theistic evolutionist. Uh, actually, when you talk to anybody about um, the idea of intelligent design, it's really theistic evolution. God was behind the evolutionary process. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, and Dawkins basically in this is argues, well, you know, just because you get to this point we don't know anything anymore, you can't suddenly stick God in there. Right. <laughs> and, you know, uh, and, uh, you know, I mean, my favorite my favorite quote of Dawkins is from the blind watchmaker in which he said that biology is the study of things that appear to have a design of <laughs> systems that appear to have a design I, by his own admission you know it looks like somebody designed this um, but it's you know complete dumb luck yep yeah it's just like my my watch um well, which is, you know, the, the basis for the thing is I, I found this watch and I'm convinced that it came together uh, purely by um, by erosion and chance. And, and um, wow, it works really well. You know, I always use this illustration in my uh, in my confirmation classes. And, um, you know, but I I I don't see any creator. It's, it's pretty amazing because uh, just the way that that the dust and stuff is kind of blown across it. Um, it, it, it actually looks like it says made in China on the back, but I know that since I didn't see anybody actually create it, I can't prove that anybody made it, uh, that it must've just come together purely by chance. And, and I know that because this is way less complex than even a blade of grass and blades of grass came together just by chance. Uh, of course, Richard Dawkins Fred was Douglas Adams, the writer of The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, who, by the way, that looks like a digital watch you've got there. I remember he, you know, he used to wonder why he, people thought digital watches were so cool. Uh, but uh, he had, uh, 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 he and Dawkins were very close friends, and um, it was interesting listening to him because he talks it, 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 in his last book, which he never finished, it was really a collection of essays and stuff that they found after he died. Um, he had this one speech that he gave uh, to National Academy of Science, I think, on evolution, and talked about um, really talked about the evolution of the computer and the evolution of the program. By the way, Adams was a big Mac fan, and um, you know, and, and and I sat there and I listened to him as he talked about how programs evolved and this evolved and things. I thought. But there was a designer behind all that improvement. <laughs> And I was like, did anybody stand up and say that? Well, you know, that's the day, it's like the day that um, I was sitting in my biology 101 class at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, not exactly a bastion of uh, conservative theology or anything. And um, and I'm listening to the professor, I'm in this huge, you know, lecture hall, there's probably, you know, 2,000 people in there. And um, and they've got this, uh, remember these old Tupperware animals? where you could like put them together and there's like giraffe and a 
pig and or no mm-hmm. elephant and, and stuff like that. And you could like take the pieces apart and put it back together as different, you know, kind of mix and match. Well, they've got one of these and um and they put it in a box and they kind of shake it and like see you know if you take a look at this you can there's i could shake this you know for a million years and it's never going to come together and i have no idea what point they were trying to make but i'm sitting there going wow they just proved that there has to be a god (laughs) because you know you could and you could take, you know, a pile of bricks and put dynamite under it in a in an enclosed uh, uh, space and blow it up and watch the bricks fall. And they're never going to land in the shape of a house unless you're in a Popeye cartoon. <laughs> so true. Work for Popeye all the time. Yeah, it did. So I. <sighs> Yeah, boy, it sure does look like someone designed it, doesn't it? This is madness. Yeah, anyway, I'm, I'm, it's kind of unfortunate, really, kind of reading about the um, uh, reading the article, the, the, the interview, because Bill O'Reilly doesn't it doesn't do one of the best jobs I've ever heard of, of arguing, and <laughs> it sounds like they just kind of get into this argument about, I don't know, uh, 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 what works and what doesn't, and uh, all kinds of things. Oh, O'Reilly kind of uses it's like hillbilly logic, but you know he goes. Uh, no offense, Jim. <laughs> Sorry. Um, Better than cheese had logic. <laughs> O'Reilly says science doesn't advance the human condition in any moralistic way, and Jesus did. See, my thesis is that everybody, if everybody followed the teachings of Jesus Christ, that we'd have peace on earth, love your brother, everybody would love one another, and we'd all almost be an idyllic civilization. <laughs> okay. Um, even the Christians can't manage that one, okay? Um, O'Reilly doesn't really understand the concept of sin. All right. Um, so, yeah, if everybody followed it, yeah, that'd be great, but that's not really possible. So if everyone, you know, even if everybody believed that, that's not going to all of a sudden transform the world. Um, but, uh, you know, at the same time, he's also completely missing the point of Jesus. I mean, he says, I'm sticking with Judeo-Christian philosophy, right? There is no Judeo-Christian philosophy. Judaism and Christians have a completely different understanding of the world and of God and of um, of of religion and of even you know how we understand the Ten Commandments and how we you know it's I mean, it, it's yes we both use the Old Testament <laughs> that's about where the well, similarities end. Well, no, there is a Judeo-Christian philosophy. It's called the Law. Well, okay, yeah. <laughs> like, like, yeah. That's, you know, I mean, that's, if that's what you're talking about, well, yes. I mean, yes, we both affirm the law. Um, and But that's kind of the extent of it. But, uh, yeah. so, but you know what? I wonder if someone for the future changed things. Maybe that's why the King James Bible is so good. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Somebody for the future went back and changed it. This is a weird story. Isn't it? And you know, it was. It's. It's really. It's. It's a science story, not a religion story. But this is a perfect example of um, of of science being treated as religion, or something being treated. I don't know. Um, yeah, the scientist. This is from the news. dot com out of Australia. Uh, new scientists claim that the giant atom smashing large hadron collider is being jinxed from the future to save the world. <laughs> Danish physicist, physicist Dr. Holger Beck Nielsen and Dr. Masao Niomiya from Japan claim that nature is trying to prevent the LHC from finding the elusive Higgs, Higgs boson called the God particle. The theoretical boson could explain the origins of mass in the universe, uh, which, by the way, is what um, Dawkins says, you know, you can't explain, if physicists can find the darn thing. Uh, 
The scientists say their math proves nature will ripple backward through time to stop the LHC before it can create the God Particle like a time traveler goes back to kill his grandfather. So... That must be some wild math. I know. I know. I I don't remember that in my calculus class, you know. (laughs) That must be that new math. (laughs) No. Um, (coughs) They said... uh, One could almost say that we have a model for God. He rather hates Higgs particles and attempts to avoid them. Right? And yet, they can't create this thing, even with a multi-billion dollar machine that they forgot to get the extended warranty on, um, and or keep the receipt for, which they also spent, like, what, 20 years building or something like that? Okay? And they're saying that, you know, sort of nature rebels against actually creating one of these things. And yet this is what was supposed to have come together just randomly. You know, they can't even intelligently design it. (laughs) And they're saying that even nature rebels against it being designed. And yet that's, you know, it just came together by chance. Um, So this is, We were talking about Douglas Adams, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, and this article totally reminded me of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy's definition of the babble fish, all right? And so I found the the quote, and and so I'm just going to read it. It's it's a little long, but it's it's really great. All right. Um, The babble fish is a small, yellow, leech-like, and probably the oddest thing in the universe. It feeds on brainwave energy received not from its own carrier, but from those around it. It absorbs all unconscious mental frequencies from the brainwave energy to nourish itself with. It then excretes into the mind of its carrier a telepathic matrix formed by combining the conscious thought frequencies with nerve signals picked up from the speech centers of the brain which has supplied them. The practical upshot of all this is that if you stick a babblefish in your ear, you can instantly understand anything said to you in any form of language. The speech patterns you actually hear decode the brainwave matrix which has been fed into your mind by your babblefish. Now, it is such a bizarrely improbable coincidence that anything so mind-bogglingly useful could have evolved purely by chance that some thinkers have chosen to see it as the final and clinching proof of the non-existence of God. The argument goes like this. I refuse to prove that I exist, says God, for proof denies faith, and without faith I am nothing. But, says man, the babblefish is a dead giveaway, isn't it? I could not have evolved by chance. It proves you exist, and so therefore, by your own arguments, you don't. QED. Oh dear, says God, I hadn't thought of that, and promptly disappears in a puff of logic. Oh, that was easy, says man, and for an encore goes on to prove that black is white and gets himself killed in the next zebra crossing. Most leading theologians claim that this argument is a load of bingo's kidneys. (laughs) But that didn't stop Ulan Kalafid from making a small fortune when he used it as a central theme for his best-selling book, Well, That About Wraps It Up for God. Meanwhile, the poor babblefish, by effectively removing all barriers to communication between different races and cultures, has caused more and bloodier wars than anything else in the history of creation. <laughs> now, of course, the flaw, even if such a thing existed, the flaw in um, in Adam's... Uh, theory here is that God does not depend on faith to exist. If that were the case, Jesus could never come back um, for the final resurrection um, because then faith will cease. We will live by sight. And, um, but this is basically this bizarre convoluted and, and self-contradicting philosophy that is in that you just heard. This is basically the same. I mean, it's analogous to what these guys are proposing. God doesn't want us to know that he exists. And so we're, we're trying to prove that he doesn't exist and he's trying to stop us. You know, <laughs> what? and there's particles from coming from the future to the past to stop the, the, us from getting this thing built. It's not the fact that we, you know, just loused it up, but you know, <sighs> I do you, don't do you know. imagine maybe you guys know how, maybe the people out there have a better reasoning of this. Maybe we have somebody who actually understands the God particle. You know, maybe somebody <laughs> can help us. <laughs> <laughs> That's it, the flux capacitor. See. 
we can go find out who's doing this. That's, That's what they Jeff. they're doing it wrong. They need to get it up to eighty eight miles an hour. That's the problem. It's too big. Should put the thing in a DeLorean. It'd be good to go then. When will this insanity end? <laughs> okay, folks, we're losing it here. We're gonna end it right here before it goes on any sillier tonight. Um Maybe you have a comment on this. I don't know what to think of it. Podcast at crossfeednews.com. Uh, as always, thank you folks for listening. It, wait, it is wait, a good We got some today. feedback. Oh, we got some feedback. I'm sorry. Yeah, we got, we got some feedback. Carlos, Carlos ended up in Canada. Uh, you know, I got a guy that worked on the Phoenix Lander and, 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 you know, you know, ours and ours and, and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, and, uh, he's, he's. So. so he said uh, the latest show with Joe Burnham, when Jim was gone, was a blast. Dense with trash stereotypes and misconceptions, setting the record straight with good humor. I sensed that he was craving for an opportunity to vent his comments. He also took most of the time because of that. Consider inviting him to join the program more often, even if this means not having a video feed from him. Um, we would love to have Joe more often. And um and Jim, we're not gonna take this as um <laughs> you're being replaced. <laughs> um there's there's a few things there's a, a few reasons that um that we don't have Joe on, on a regular basis. Um number one, Jim and I are both in the eastern time zone now, and Joe lives in Denver. That's mountain time zone, which means that when I we record at nine o'clock at night here, and so that's eleven o'clock at night. If we wait, if we wait until nine o'clock his time, which is about when he's usually available, <laughs> and uh, that makes for a pretty late night. Now it's not quite as bad for me because I have Fridays off, and once I get my kids off to school, I can go back to bed. Um, Jim's got to work though, and uh, and you know even for me, I I don't get much sleep the rest of the week either, so I kind of value um, making up some of that sleep instead of. Uh, you know, digging myself deeper. Um, the other thing is that Joe is going off to um, Africa at the end of this year, and uh, he's going to be gone for a few months. And so he's kind of busy packing and, and, you know, making arrangements and all that kind of stuff right now. Uh, he's a pretty busy guy. And um, and then, you know, he's going to be in Africa, and boy, talk about time zone differences. Um, so, but, uh, Carlos, I really appreciate your comment. I passed it on to Joe and he really appreciated it too. And, um, and you know, maybe some, at some point in the future we can arrange, you know, to have him on more often than that. I'd love to, um, to get him, you know, his perspectives from Africa, especially when, you know, once he gets there and he's there for a little while and that. So, um, um, I guess, uh, you know, I can say that I'm really glad, um, to, to hear that positive feedback, um, uh, that, uh, when, when Jim can't be here that, uh, you know, I really appreciate having Joe on. I, I think he's a really great guy and, um, and, and I really appreciate his input on things. So, so yeah, thanks again. So yeah, if, uh, if any of you think that Jim should be replaced, you can, <laughs> Finished, Pinky. I'm expendable. <laughs> you you notice that when I'm gone, we don't have a show. <laughs> Boy, no control. <laughs> of course, that's Dale's I the do tech all guy, the, not me. I do all the editing. <laughs> so, oh. but uh, yeah, love the comments and. Um, and love to hear from more of you about it. Um, just a reminder, if you're watching this, I know a lot of people are watching this on YouTube and um, various other uh, websites, that uh, if you go to crossfeednews.com slash podcast, uh, you'll find a higher quality uh, feed, higher quality video. Um, we have to compress it quite a bit to put it on the, those other sites. It ends up looking kind of blurry and blocky, and it's by no means perfect, um, in the original file, but it's definitely better. And so, uh, if the, if the blurriness and that kind of annoys you, you might want to check that out. 
So, or you can just subscribe if you, um, you know, if you use iTunes or, uh, something else that can handle podcasts. Um, you know, even like, um, Apple's mail program or the various other mail programs that can handle RSS feeds. They'll down, a lot of them will download the, um, you know, the video file or the audio if you're, um, which is also available if you have more limited bandwidth, um, or an audio player, not a video player. Um, or you just don't want to look at our faces. And, um, so you can just get it that way too. There's lots of different ways to get it. So, um, we really appreciate you, uh, catching us each week, roughly each week. Uh, so, uh, we should be back next week. So we'll see you next week. Yep. Take care. God bless you this week. Yep. Good night, everybody. God bless you.